So ICAO is the International Civil Aviation Organization. We are a specialized agency of the United Nations, and we basically deal with standards and recommended practice for aviation. I'm the Deputy Director for the Capacity Development and Implementation Bureau. ICAO has uh, five bureaus, so CDI, uh, the Air Navigation Bureau, the Air Transport Bureau, um, and the Administration Bureau. What we do, well, so ICAO is headquartered in Montreal, Canada, uh, and we have five uh, regional offices around the world. Um, and it's uh, they have to, to, to tend to or to, to work closely with our member states. Uh, we have one in Mexico City uh, for the North America, Central America and Caribbean, one in uh, Lima, Peru for South America, uh, and, and Bangkok for Asia Pacific with a sub-regional office in, in uh, Beijing, China. Uh, we have a in, in Nairobi um, and in Dakar for, for Western Africa and Eastern Africa, uh, and then for the Middle East in Egypt. Um, so whilst the, well, the Administration Bureau is very, very um, self-explanatory, they, they run the, the, um, the organization, um, you know, human resources, and the, the, the normal things. Uh, we have two standard making or mainly standard making bureaus, which is the Air Transport Bureau um, and the Air Navigation Bureau. One deals with air transport like passports, uh, like facilitation that gets you in and out of borders, uh, border crossing. We do the um, uh, passport standards, for example, and then Air Navigation Bureau that deals with the movement of aircraft um, and all the regulations that go uh, alongside with that. And then CDI, uh, the, the Capacity Development and Implementation Bureau, where, where I'm at, we do the implementation. So we help states, or remember, we, we call states, country states. We help them um, they would implement the standards that the other side of the house uh, develops. Um, my background, I, I've been with IKO for uh, 14 years. Um, I, I was in the other side of the house until very recently when I uh, got promoted to this job, um, basically doing um, operational safety standards. Um, and now, now I'm I'm here in the implementation side, <laughs> learning how hard it is to implement some of our standards sometimes. Excellent question. So. Uh, to, to answer this question, uh, it's important to try and, and think how how is it that one airplane can take off in one country and fly across the world um, and land in another country, in another state, as we call them, um, and for that airplane's registration, air navigation uh, certificate, uh, airworthiness certificate, um, the licenses of the pilots. What makes those that aircraft um, fly around the world and have th those certificates recognized by by the different states? So the standards that, that we make, um, you can think of them as they 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 draft the intent of of how a license should work, how a certificate should work, how a registration should work. But the legal framework of every state, every country is, is different. Yes, there's some that are very similar um, in Europe, for example, um, but they're all different. Um, so what we, the standards that we do are implemented as state laws and regulations to meet the intent of the standard. So for example, if we have standards for licensing that specify certain requirements to for, for a state for a country to issue a license the way to meet those standards to meet the requirements may be different in every state because their their regulatory framework might be different but the fact is that at the end of the process they meet the standard that we drafted in annex one licensing for example 
Um, this also, this the same approach also applies uh, to air navigation. So I, I'm a pilot myself. I, uh, I was an airline pilot for 24 years, um, and I actually still fly general aviation. And the fact that I can go from any part of the world to any, uh, any other part of the world and be able to navigate through um, the different airspaces and shoot the different instrument approach procedures is based on the same philosophy. Um, they're made these, these 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 procedures, these navigational um, aids are there to meet the international standards. Um, it, for infrastructure, it's a little bit more precise, right? Because if we say that uh, uh, you know runway edge lights should be white, uh, they have to be white. <laughs> There's no 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 um, no ifs ands and buts on that. But uh, for example, in the, in the different approach procedures. You know, we don't say you have to have an approach procedure, but if you're going to have this type of approach procedure, for example, an instrument landing system, it needs to meet the standards. Um, and the reason for that is because this, you know, there's there's two two sides of the coin to find an approach procedure, right? So you have the ground infrastructure or, or satellite based infrastructure, but you also have the airborne infrastructure. The aircraft is is equipped. Uh, with certain instrumentation, some certain avionics to be able to fly those. Um, and by having that common reference point um, allows you to, and in and, and, and states, countries that meet that, um, allows you to fly those procedures. So what what we do is create the standards that, that allow aircraft to fly internationally. Um, and of course, that's that's the air navigation side of the house. Of course, that's my my background. But on the um, Air Transport Bureau side of the house, um, it also uh, streamlines the security protocols. Uh, as you may be going through airports and, and you see a lot of con things pretty much uh, the same as far as, you know, whether you can um, pass liquids and, and things like that. All that comes from standards that we write here. Um, also, for like I said, uh, we, we issue the, the standards for passports, and as you know, we're going into electronic uh, passports, and you you've probably seen that with some of the chips. So what? Um, that, and you have a little passport that has like a little you know chip on it, um, engraved on it, that denotes that it's an electronic passport and facilitates border border crossings. Um, the standards on on what information should be in the chip and how that information is then transferred. Uh, and verified is are, are made here at, at, at ICAO. Uh, so, in in a nutshell, we create the the standards that allow um, the, the the seamless travel between um, international travel between states. So, ICAO contributes to several uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals through its effort uh, to enhance global civil aviation. Um, specifically with uh, SDG 13 climate action, ICAO's carbon offsetting uh, reduction scheme for international aviation uh, is, is a key initiative to address greenhouse emissions. Um, and it's often referred to, you probably heard about it, uh, Corsia. Uh, so Corsia establishes a framework for airlines to offset their emissions through the pur purchase of, of carbon offsets. Um, additionally, last year at the 41st session of the ICAO Assembly, um, states uh, adopted a long-term uh, global aspirational goal for international aviation of a net zero carbon emissions by 2050 in support of the Paris Agreements for temperature control, or te temperature goal. This, this is, a, this is easier said than done. It was is, is an agreement that uh, reinforces the leadership in ICAO uh, on issues related to international aviation and climate change. Um, the the achievement will also underpin ICAO's technical standards, you know, covering topics like optimizing of airspace, integration of innovation, new technologies, um, and technical standards to to assure the safety and sustainability of aviation, sustainable aviation fuels. We're doing our part. 
we are here doing our part to meet and, and work with the Greater UN and and to address the um, the many challenges that we all have. Um, and climate climate change is, is just one of them. Well, if I say, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie, this is X-ray Yankee Zulu, you'll probably say, geez, what, what are you talking about? Uh, so this is what we call the, the phonetic uh, alphabet. And for each letter of the alphabet, we've come up with a word and you've probably heard it when you, you know, uh, do a, a phone reservation and they ask you to spell out your name. Um, and it, 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 it depends where you are, right? You might um, you might get uh, people expelling it out, you know, A is an apple, N is a Nancy and, and things like that. So so what we've created is a phonetic alphabet and, and we have different words um, and the the application of, of that phonetic alphabet goes way beyond aviation. You, you see it a lot in, in radio telephony, um, you know, police, amateur radios, um, it, it all comes, they, they all use that. And that it, it, it's, it's pretty cool to see how, how you know, um, these arbitrary words that somebody chose a long time before I started working here, you know, are still, are still being used and, and used by a wider community than um, than the the the, the just the aviation um, the aviation ecosystem, and if if you if you look at some of those words, so for example, uh, there's a, a little bit of history around them. Um, so Q we use you know Quebec. That's and and the reason for Quebec is because the KO's headquarters is in the, in, the, in the province of Quebec here in Canada and, and things like that. But there, there's many standards, and of course, I've been involved in writing a lot of them. Um, and to me, uh, as as a, as a professional, you know, you know, a lot of my satisfaction uh, on those standards is, you know, trying to address some of the uh, issues that have caused accidents. Um, it's unfortunate that that's what led to the developing of those standards. Um, and I can give you examples of, um, you know, accidents like the Avianca accident in, in New York City where they ran out of fuel um, and we've created, uh, you know, standards and guidance and, and, and practices, recommended practices um, that allow for pilots and air traffic controllers to understand or have the same language to identify the, the fuel state of an aircraft. Um, Another more recent accident, um, the Malaysian uh, 370, as you know, that's the, the airliner that, that went missing and we still haven't been able to find the aircraft. Uh, well, we've, we've learned from, from that experience and we've put you know, standards in place so it doesn't happen again. Um, we're in the process now of, of um, rolling out the, uh, an entire system called the Global Aeronautical Distress Safety System. Uh, that'll have a component that will um, actually track aircraft that are in a distress situation, um, irrespective of you know, a pilot input. So that to me is very exciting because you know at the end of the day, you know things happen, but we learn from those uh, those incidents and accidents, um, and we we try to put place things in place so so they don't happen again.